Hi, everybody. This is Ann Patchett at Parnassus Books. Thank you for listening to Parnassus Presents. Your support allows us to keep bringing you fantastic events. So please consider purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book at the link below. We hope you enjoy the event recorded live from the Parnassus stage. All right. Thank you so much for coming out tonight for this great YA event. I'm Rayanne Parker. I am the Director of Books and Events for Young Readers here, and I'm so glad to welcome two YA historical authors tonight. Um, a brief introduction for them first. We have Cambria Gordon visiting us. She's the critically acclaimed author of The Poetry of Secrets, The Down-to-Earth Guide to Global Warming, and her newest YA historical, which we're celebrating tonight, Trajectory. She'll be in conversation with Nashville author Sharon Cameron, and Sharon is the author of the Reese Book Club pick, an international bestseller, The Light in Hidden Places, along with Artifice, Bluebird, and many other novels. They'll be in conversation, then they'll do a Q&A, and then we'll have a signing line. So please welcome to the stage, Cambria Gordon and Sharon Cameron. Thank you so much, Rayanne. And I am so thrilled to be here today with, uh, with my friend, Cami. We are um, sisters in publishing. We share the same lovely editor. So um, we, have, we have known each other for a little, a little while now. And I feel um, so lucky to get to talk to you about this book, uh, Trajectory. I, I haven't told you yet. But I really loved this book. I really enjoyed it. Um, what a page turner! I think I, I think I read it almost in one sitting. Um, I would have read it in one sitting if my family hadn't been bothersome and bothered me. But uh, I really, really enjoyed the book. So why don't you tell everyone um, what this book is about and and set it up for us? Hi everybody. Thank you for coming and thank you, Sharon, so much for doing this with me. So this is a story of a very shy young lady during World War II on the home front. Um, we've all read a lot of stories about World War that take place during World War II um, in Europe, but I kind of thought we haven't heard that much about what went on with the young people and especially the young women during um, World War II who lived in the United States. So um, I found out about this story through um, a public, a PBS, video called Secret Rosies, Top Secret Rosies. And we all know about Rosie the Riveter. She was encouraging women to join the war effort and women should work in factories when the men were overseas. But what about the women who were the brainiacs, who were good in science and math and engineering? Well, um, it turns out that there was a group of young women who worked in a secret lab in the basement of the engineering school at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And it was called the, the PCS, the Philadelphia Computing Section. And um, one young woman was in high school, and I kind of thought, that's whose story I want to tell. So this is the story of Eleanor, a very shy, shy girl who, who is a math whiz, and unfortunately cannot reveal her math abilities, because there was a, a family tragedy when she was a young woman, and she has been holding her secret inside of her about her abilities for her entire life. So she doesn't want anyone to know that she's good at math. And she gets recruited for this, this secret math lab. And that's where the story starts. So I, I'm interested in the fact that you wrote this character who is great at math. And maybe that's why I liked the character so much, because I love to read about people who are the opposite of me. Um, so I, I, that is not my gift for sure. And I, I wrote um, a character um, like that in one of my first books, I think, because it was just so interesting to me to explore a brain that was so different from mine. So I have to ask you. Um, are, are, is, that, is that your kind of brain? Are you great at math? Or, or was this something you really had to, to research? I am not good at math. Um, well, good. That wouldn't <laughs> have been fair if you were good at writing it. No, in. that's, yeah, definitely two different sides of the brain. Yeah. Um, in fact, when, when you and I were in school, um, we had pre-algebra, algebra, geometry, algebra two, 
and if you were really good, you went on to trigonometry and then pre-calc and calc. I went to algebra two, that was it. I couldn't wait to be done. And um, so I had to consult with many experts on this. Um, in fact, my son is here and I, I found a math student at his high school at the time who was good but um, wasn't even at a high enough level. And then I asked his teacher and she said, this is even above my pay grade for, for the kind of calculus and physics that this character needs to do. So I found a, a PhD candidate at UCLA and that's ultimately who really did the lion's share for me. But then of course I had to understand what I was writing to make it accessible to the reader. So the, I kind of had to understand what I was doing, but honestly, I, I could never replicate it now, and I could not even solve any of the problems in the book. Well, <laughs> I, I think, you know, the, the way the book is set up, no one could, because she's not just a math whiz, she's a math genius. Um, and she has the kind of genius that not only allows her to compute numbers, but to visualize those numbers, to see math as an image. Um, did you interview people who um, had that kind of ability? That was really interesting to me. I did not interview anybody I imagined. I mean, actually, I was inspired by the character in The Queen's Gambit, right. um, the television show, because I loved how she saw a chessboard, and I loved how when she was asleep, the chess pieces moved on, in like a hologram and then found the right square, and that's how she won her tournaments. And so Eleanor um, does see, she's very visual, and um, she sees things in a different way, and things do float in front of her. So that was my inspiration. Yeah, that, I, I found that really, really interesting to, to read about. So, so we touched a little bit on your research then, and, and how you researched the, the math and physics um, portion of this. Um, how, what, what kind of researcher are you? Can you talk about your process? I'm a geek. I'm a really big oh, research geek, <laughs> and as I'm sure you are too, because <laughs> it's people like us. We it's hard to even like leave the research and then do the writing. That's my challenge: is <laughs> yes. to actually say, "Okay, Cami, you've done enough research. It's time to start." Because I get caught up in the minutia. Um, but so different things. I mean, I talk to people. For this book, I, I interviewed quite a few people. Um, uh, someone at Pearl Harbor in the um, museum there. He was really, really instrumental with the Norden bomb site, which is a, a part mm -hmm. of this book. I went to, I drove out to um, the Air Force Base in the desert in California. It's now called Edwards Air Force Base, but it used to be Muroc. And I met the archivists there and spoke to them and looked through all their files. Um, and um, and then I, I looked for articles. And like I told mm -hmm. you, the PBS video, which was the first inspiration mm -hmm. and Google, um, you know, simple Google searches. But there's also, you know, like I, you probably know JSTOR and these kind of geeky research, yes. um, mm -hmm. uh, what do they call listservs that, that have a lot of papers that people write, you know, experts and PhDs and, and um, historical um, writers write, write these articles and I use a lot from there. So how long did you spend on research for, for a book like this? Well. I would say I spent about three months making sure that the story would work, because if the if the Norden bomb site, like I, I needed to find out that there were problems with the Norden, so and I needed to find out if so. Explain explain for them what the Norden bomb site is. Okay, yes. so um, well let me let me first say that what Eleanor does is she calculates ballistics. Okay, what are ballistics? They're the study of firearms and projectiles. So. Um, I didn't realize that any time a gunner is shooting, any time there's a bomb dropped, there is a number and a calculus that goes with that. And there, it's very methodical. It's not done randomly. And so there are people who have to make these numbers to teach, to, to show the gunners how to do it. And they look at wind, and they look at velocity, and they look at air pressure, and they look at the temperature of the shell, and, this, and the weight of the shell. And there's so much that goes into it. So that's what Eleanor and these young women are doing in the secret lab. So um, the Norden bomb site was a secret weapon. I call it secret weapon because American, the, our armed services never could tell anybody about it. And they were very, very frightened that the Germans would get a hold of it. And it was this amazing invention by Carl Norden, who was an um, inventor who really was um, a very righteous Christian who did not want collateral damage, did not want other people to die from the bombs. So he said, okay, if I can keep the, 
if I can keep the bomb to the most accurate pinpoint place and have the least amount of casualties, that is something that I really want to do. So he invented this bomb sight, which is a machine that sits in the nose of the airplane that makes sure that all the bombs are dropped accurately. I was just going to hold up this um, this ballistic chart for you, well, because you I remembered you had that. So yeah, this is what the what the girls were calculating. Right? This is kind of what they were calculating. So this actually just says cartridge, and this, so it's a bunch of different cartridges as opposed to like an, a howitzer or the uh, or a name of a of a weapon. And then here we have average muzzle velocity, time of flight to one thousand yards, elevation, maximum range, and weight of rounds. So this is just one example of one ballistic table. Right. But going back to the research, um, I, know I needed to understand that the Norden was not always accurate. And so once I realized that, and once I could, could um, understand that it, a young woman could actually be involved in the army and in a combat situation, and that there are civilians who are allowed to do that, I thought, OK, this story could work. Wow. That, and, and that is just a. It, it was such an interesting um, insight to me to know that a young woman could end up on a bomber. Um, I just I, I would have never I would have never guessed that that was even possible. Can you talk about some of the real people that were that, some of the real young women that were in this program? Sure. So let's. Yeah. There is one photograph. Yeah. Um, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. What? Rayanne's going to come assist. Oh, good. Because it's not standing up enough. So. Eleanor is based on one of the 10 young women in the um, Philadelphia computing section. And that they were computers, oh, but that? they were not machines. They were human computers. So these, these girls were the last of the human computers before machines could do the computing. So I'm going to, there's a picture of 10 young women. Um, I just wanted to show. So it's mm -hmm. a um, great picture. It's a blurry, unfortunately, because I blew it up. Oh, but. Okay. You can see these these women, and most of them were college um, uh, co-eds majoring in math. A few were math teachers in elementary school, and there was this one high schooler. And this young woman, Alice, is, was the only woman of color in this group, and um, I based a character in my book after Alice as well. She becomes best friends with Eleanor. So, um, and, and I would say, like, I think four of these women went on to work on the ENIAC, which became the first digital computer. So most people know about the ENIAC, or maybe you don't, but that, that the PCS girls were the precursors to the ENIAC women, and, and ENIAC men, too. Wow, that is that. I mean, it's a it's a fascinating true story. And I think, you know, as a as a historical fiction writer, that is that is what always um, just grabs me. You know, the, these uh, these stories that were real, and then you can bring you know to a wider audience and and create things that could have been real as well, even if not every single bit of it was. It's all based on the reality. Yeah, it's all based on the reality. I mean, I like imagining what they would say and feel if they were in those situations. And I put some Easter eggs in the in the um, book because, so for instance. Um, there's a house mother. The girls live in a, a fraternity um, at the University of Pennsylvania campus, because the, and it's empty because the guys are in in um, overseas. And I I named the house mother Mrs. Goldstein because there was a mathematician um, and her name was Goldstein, and her husband Goldstein was also very very involved in the ENIAC. So I just wanted to put her name in, and then. Um, Mrs. Motchley, who's the who runs the math group, who's the main math teacher for these young women, her husband John was a professor at the time, and she was a, a, a real mathematician at the time, and they both worked at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and then there's a nurse at Pearl Harbor that I I, I name her by name. Um, I don't know what her personality was like, but I imagine what she was like, and she interfaces with Eleanor also. Mm -hmm. So when when you're researching and and you're mining all of this rich material, you know, for story. I, I imagine you have the same issue that I do with deciding where, where do I, I can't put everything in that I found out, right? So how, where do you try to draw that line between these amazing facts, but, you know, it can also can't be a thousand page book? So it's true, like sometimes if I find a piece of research, I can almost do another book <laughs> about this other character and go down that rabbit hole. Um, 
And it is, you have to say goodbye to some really fascinating things. Um, but you have to also have the through line, and you know this. You, you know, Eleanor has her, her trajectory, which is, you know, the double meaning of the, of the book title. And if it doesn't really fit with that, then it can't stay. So it's kind of like, you know, when you learn um, about writing, if everything doesn't serve the plot or serve the character mm -hmm. to advance mm -hmm. that plot, then you have to say goodbye. Um, but I, you know, I did get in some, I thought, pretty fascinating things. And even if it was just a small scene, and I tried to make it fit into her, her trajectory. Well, one of the things that I appreciated about the story is that it, it's also talking about um, you know, of course, not only just the the reason that we are at war, you know, in World War II, um, because of what is happening to the people around the world, the the inequality, um, the persecution of the Jewish people, and and what was happening, um, but then also what was happening on American soil um, with our people who we were marginalizing at the time. And so, did you make a very um, did you make a decision, a very conscious decision, to add those elements into the story? Um, or, or was that just a natural outflow of the time you were writing about? I was, I didn't plan to talk about the Japanese internment camps or racism, um, you know, or segregation that was going on against the, um, the Negro, that's what the word they used at the time, the Negro mm -hmm. community. Um, because I thought I was just going to tell this story of this young woman, and she was a mathematician, and she was a Jewish young woman, so she had family in Poland who was, who was being forced into a ghetto. But it turned out in my research that there was so much racism in Philadelphia, which was strange and interesting in the North and unexpected mm -hmm. um, and, and upsetting. And then, of course, the Japanese internment camps, which were going on, and I... I kind of thought there's a lot of similarities with people being taken from their homes, the Japanese and the Jewish and the, and the Jews, um, and then blacks not allowed into certain establishments. Um, so I did want to draw those parallels, and um, that became a, a way to enrich the story. And then when I found out about Alice, the only woman of color in PCS, I really thought here's an opportunity to tell those stories in Philadelphia. And, and also, I don't know if everyone even realizes, I mean, there were black regiments. Everything was segregated. Mm -hmm. the, the, the army base was segregated. The entertainment on the army base was segregated. And I, wa I really wanted to, to point that out. Yeah, I, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. I think it, it, um, it rounds the story um, really well to have not just one Jewish young woman's story, but to have all of these American stories, the the good and the bad, and you know, and it's and it's men versus women, and you know, it's issues of color, it's issues of, of religion, it's 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 everything. It permeates everything. So I'm so glad that that you rounded the story out like that. So um, I guess I'll I'll just ask this this question. I I personally love to ask this question. So I. I really believe in passion, in, in what you're writing about, um, in, in taking these subjects that become so, so meaningful and you know, pouring those things out on the page. And, and I certainly felt that you had done that in this book, that you, that you were very passionate. So what, what makes you passionate about writing and telling these stories. It could be this story or with poetry of secrets or what makes you really want to sit down in front of that computer and do all of that research and create these stories? What drives it? That's a good question, a hard question. I, I didn't I, warn you, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I really want people to know about these parts of history, but not World War II, and not necessarily the Inquisition, um, and not even really about global warming, which was the nonfiction book from a long time ago, but to know um, a small little part of a human experience during those times in history. Um, so, you know, we, it's really hard to tell the, a, a very large 
story, a World War II story or a story of, of the Spanish Inquisition. Um, but if you can find a way in with one person's emotions um, and experience, then a reader will hopefully like it and relate to it and, and look at that time of history a little bit differently and, and learn something and feel something. So that is what drives me is like, you know, I, I just want one person, one reader to connect to it and, and say, wow, I didn't know that. I, I can absolutely understand where you're coming from on that. I, th I think I, I feel I feel the exact the exact same way um, about when when I am writing. So do you, what, what do you think um, what do you think the if you had to choose one part of this book um, that is the part that is 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 your passion, that part that really means the most to you if you have to zero it down to one part, what do you think it is that you really hope that one reader takes with them? Probably the fear, um, the overcoming of the fear that Eleanor has um, and feeling like she can't really do much of anything to help anybody. And so the helplessness that maybe we all might feel when there's something bad going on in the world and we want to speak out, but we think we're one person. And if we have, if we vote for a certain candidate, we're just one person. And how will that matter? And so, I, so for for me, the if I could distill it down, it's that Eleanor is able to overcome her fears um, and actually do something that matters and that will will save lives. And, and I think that's exactly what, what I pulled out of this story. You know, Eleanor's trajectory as a character is um, going from someone who does not know how to use her talents, who does not know how to use her voice, who becomes someone who discovers that she has things to offer. And um, I, I, I try to write about those things all the time because I think we're all so much more powerful than, than we realize that we are and that we have things to offer even when those things don't seem important to the surface, that's not actually true. And so that is absolutely what I pulled from this book. So thank you so much for, for writing it. Um, so, do you want to show, I was, I was gonna ask you a little bit more um, before we completely leave the research and, and that kind of thing, I was gonna ask you a little bit more about writing process, but would you like to show um, any more of these? You have some great photographs here of some of the real yeah, people. I'll show, I'll show yeah. this one. I, I think this is kind of, um, explains a lot also. So this looks like a foosball table, it's not. It's, it's actually called a differential analyzer and Eleanor calls it Annie in the story. Um, but this is a machine that, that does calculus, and um, I, it's also the beginning, the precursor to the computer. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was pretty, pretty wild, and also Eleanor interfaces with that machine a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. It was, it's, a, it's a really cool early, early computer is what that, you know, really what it is, and it's amazing that they're so huge. And now we can do that. On our phone. So huge with all these tubes and, and rods and, and massive, like took up the entire room. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing. Well, well, let's talk just a little bit about um, writing process. I have never talked to you about this, despite the fact that we uh, work with the same person and, and all of those things. So, um, so we've talked a little bit about why you come to a story. Um, what is your process for getting that story on paper? So I outline. Um, oh, you're one of those. Yeah, because the history, <laughs> you know why? It's so complicated with the history and with the research. And, um, and also Lisa likes to have, this is our editor, likes to have the, the outline sort of chapter. Does she? <laughs> <laughs> even if we don't stick with it, um, <laughs> even if that isn't the finished product, I think it helps when she's trying to sell it. But... So I do outline, um, and but I also allow myself to to discover, which is like I said, I didn't really know that I was going to get into the whole um, the racism and the and the experience of the Japanese 
And I thought I was just going to tell sort of a sexism story of a young woman who was a math whiz and how the male army didn't want her. But it turned out not to be that. It didn't, wasn't as simple as that. Um, and so, um, but, and I, I, I mentioned that I love the research, but I also really like writing the first page. And so it's, okay. well, it, not that it will stick, but I have to also tell myself, it's, you're not ready to write the first page. So I have to, I do both. I'm into the research and I'm also like antsy to write the first page. And it doesn't stick. I mean, I, I, I write mm -hmm. the first page 60 times, mm -hmm. but I like to try to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's like a weird, like, it's like a spoiler alert or like a fun thing that I can treat myself with. And then the middle's really hard and I hate the middle and I want to quit. And I, I feel like it's slowing down and there's, it's not interesting and oh no, I like the end, I like the beginning. So that's hard for me, that's a challenge. Um, and I try to write every single day. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. to really be very disciplined and treat it like my full-time job, and it is my full-time mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. I understand exactly what you're saying. I was teasing about the outline because I'm not a great outliner, but when you are writing something that does have this historic basis, then there there's some reality there. There are dates that need to be respected, and, and you do need to have an outline and a timeline, you know, that that fits, but, but like you, um, I, I find that when I do create that outline in that story that it's very important to allow it then to grow organically. And it is amazing when a story grows into something that you didn't know it was going to be. I think that's, that's the joy of writing, I think, for me. It's, it's certainly a, a, joyful, uh, a joyful process. And the subconscious that happens when you're in a flow, which doesn't happen all, every day. Right. And if it happens like once, you know, in a, f in a few months, you're happy. Yes. But yeah, that's a real a real high. Because and because that's where the passion is coming out too. I think sometimes we we come to a story for a certain reason. We feel so strongly, you know, about about this history or the story or this subject matter. And then as you're writing, because you are engaging that, you discover what else the story is, and it comes out in ways that, you know, we didn't even know, was possible. Which is such a beautiful process. Yeah, I guess that's why we do this crazy thing. It's why we do this crazy thing we're doing. That's exactly right. Well, do you want to open up for questions? Do you think, is it time? Or do you have, or do you want to read some first? What would you like to do? I could read, um, or yeah, what time is it? We don't even know it. Okay. You have a little bit of time? Okay, yeah. Okay. I would love for you to do that then. So just to set it up, um, Eleanor is suspicious of this differential analyzer, as she calls Annie. And um, you'll hear Mrs. Motchley, who I mentioned, who's the um, head teacher for the young women. And um, there are some people in the background who have just arrived that are a little bit mysterious. And Eleanor doesn't really know who they are. Um, and she has just crawled underneath the Annie to examine it more closely. I crawl out from underneath Annie and bump into a pair of brown pumps attached to shapely calves. What in Euclid's name are you doing down there, Eleanor? Asks Mrs. Motchley. I quickly get to my feet and brush dust off my knees. She crosses her arms, waiting. I was um, wondering what it felt like to crawl around under there with no nylons on, now that we need to turn in all our silk for the war effort. She levels her gaze at me, not buying it. Just walk away, don't create a scene. They'll realize the gear problem on their own eventually. But what if they don't? Well, actually, I did notice something else while I was, you know, testing out my stocking theory. The gears are slipping. Mrs. Motchley uncrosses her arms, apparently relieved I fessed up and that it's merely a minor concern. We know about backlash, we expected some of that. In fact, I'm about to dismiss you all a little early today so we can reprogram for the next trajectory. We need to dismantle and recreate the gearing anyway. But you don't understand, I protest. Besides the backlash, I fear that any slack in the system, even if the gears are slightly misaligned or loose and worn, will cause errors. This will only get worse as more trajectories are calculated. Annie, I mean the differential analyzer, may be fast, but she isn't reliable. The other nine girls have stopped their work and are watching us. Mrs. Motchley purses her lips in renewed displeasure. At least let us take the time to recheck the analyzer's math, I beg. There's too much at stake. Lives are on the line. And then I say out loud what I've been thinking all along. 
Machines will never be as accurate as human computers. Oh God, oh God, what have I done? The room is hushed. Someone has turned off the motors. A sound comes from the corner, a throat being cleared. It's the evil looking man in the dark suit. How long has he been standing there? Mrs. Motchley and I have switched roles. She's the quiet one and I'm at the center. But what's worse is the man in the corner. He's no longer inscrutable. The expression on his face reads loud and clear. Keen interest, and he's looking directly at me. Very nice, very nice. I think what I, what I love about that scene is that that is one of the first times that Eleanor really stands up for herself and says, I know something that the rest of you don't, and if we don't fix this, people are going to die. The stakes are huge. So uh, that is, that's a great scene. Thank you. You're I, welcome. I also realize it's a little bit um, prescient of AI. Um, oh, yeah. Which that's I didn't even think about when I was writing it, but you know, everyone's always afraid of the next invention, so mm -hmm. these young girls were afraid of, of the machine which would make them obsolete. You know, us writers are afraid of AI, to, which will make us obsolete. And I think that, um, I guess maybe the lesson in this would be computers did help us and um, enrich us. Um, so maybe AI can do that too. You know, I had not thought about that issue until you brought it up, but there is actually a, a really amazing parallel, I think, because it, it parallels what I believe about AI and, and that kind of thing, that, that we have this technology. Yes, we need to regulate this technology. We need to have control of it. But the, but the technology, just like the Norden bomb site, that could not be corrected by the analyzer by a com by a early computer by a machine it took a person and a brain to to correct that and i think that's always going to be true i think it's going to, it's will always take a person and take a brain to to get where get us where we want to go i really hope so i hope that's I, true i know that i want that to be true some ai um, uh, applications are asking the humans to teach them so I know that that's happening right now. Gosh, too scary. <laughs> <laughs> too scary. I just have to remember, you know, when I first entered the publishing game, it ebooks were the new thing. You know, and everyone in the publishing industry thought ebooks was going to destroy publishing and there would be no more print books. And that was an enormous fear. And so I kind of try to remember that and think, remember when that was the fear, but what actually happened, we just have more ways to read, right? Yes. And so, so it can be that way. So I, I hold on to the, to, the, to the hope there. I like that. Yeah. Let's thank our authors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.